Hello, I'm Sharon Ross with the Capital City Arts Initiative. We are here at the Bristol Cone Gallery on the Western Nevada College campus and introducing Sydney Teske and her exhibition, A High Desert Tribute. Um, so we're going to ask her questions and get a tour of the show. Sydney, welcome. Thank you. Um, this exhibition has three dozen pieces that represent really a retrospective of your work from 1995 to 2022. Um, you began with the landscapes, and now there are figures. So when did the figures enter into the mix? They've always been there. I just haven't always shown them. Ah, OK. So the, that wasn't just a, a jump to a no. new thing. Mm -hmm. ah. Well, I heard a quote from you that landscapes fascinate me. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about where this passion comes from? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I, I've always just loved looking out at the land. And it's never the same from one second to the next. The light changes. You know, if you're moving through space, the, the geometry, all the patterns change. It's, um, it's just fascinating. You're standing next to a very large landscape. It's the largest one in the show, called Dugout. Um, tell us about Dugout. Um, this is a studio piece. It's not a plein air piece. I worked from sketches and photographs. It's a place that's 300, 400 yards from my house, just in a, in a gully down below where I live. This little kind of rock structure is an old Chinese dugout from back in the day when Tuscarora was a, an active mining community in the 1860s, early 1870s. And it's collapsing, and it's just a really interesting structure. So, well, I have always loved um, artists' work with snow. Uh, to my mind, naive mind, snow is white, but uh, I, I love the blue, all the colors that you've added to the snow. Well, thank you. You know, snow is reflective. It's it's water, and so it reflects all of the, the ambient lights and colors around it. So um, if you held up a sheet of white paper, that you would not see any white in this painting at all. There's no white. Tell us about plein air and your comment, Racing the Sun. Plein air um, is a French term for being outside in the air, and that's how I prefer to paint most of the time, when the weather's good enough. Uh, my medium is dry and doesn't respond well at all to snow or rain or anything like that. Um, so I go out and I just paint what I see in the landscape around me. Oh, and racing the sun. Um, because I'm a plein air painter, I don't have a steady source of light. My light source is the sun, and the sun is always moving. And so when I start to paint, um, I have to be very rapid and take notes throughout the course of the painting, because by the time I finish, the sun's in a totally different location, and what I first saw no longer exists. So. I'm racing the sun. Sydney, tell us about the soft pastels you use rather than oils and acrylic. When I started using color. I, I, I worked for about 18 years in black and white only. 
and color terrified me. You know, the, the more you use black and white, the more used to values you get. And then when you look out in the world and you look at color, there's bazillions of them and it's terrifying. And um, when I moved to Battle Mountain, I wanted to take some art classes. I had never taken any art classes before. And the only class that was offered was by a lady in town who taught oils. And uh, so I started learning about color through her class. And um, then I took a, a correspondence <laughs> course, watercolor class. Uh, um, and I learned more about watercolors. and. I liked both watercolor and oil, but um, I'm fairly impatient and uh, because I like to be outdoors, watercolors don't dry fast enough and oils dry too slowly and pastels are dry already, so I fell into pastels and haven't quit. Sydney, your, your figures are intriguing. Um, they're, they're not traditional standing figures. Um, they're, some of them don't even include faces. Um, talk about, and very geometric. So tell us about your compositions with figures. Uh, figures are very expressive of emotion. And I've never used heads and faces as part of that emotive expression because I think that the people tend to look at the face and they lose the emotion that I'm intending for them to feel. When, when I'm painting a figural piece they take months. These are studio pieces. Obviously, they're not plein air pieces at all. Uh, um, my intent is for the viewer to feel something, whether they understand what they see uh, <laughs> in their frontal cortex or not. You know, I want them to feel something in their body. And having no face, no head, and an, an exaggerated contortion helps me to put that expression across. A lot of my figural pieces deal with confusion and um, transition. I think that oh, as humans, we're constantly in at least two landscapes. We have our internal landscape and we're inside an external landscape. And those landscapes are, are separated by our skin. And uh, they're, they're constantly interacting. And, and I'm trying to get that across somehow. Sydney, do you use models for your figure pieces? I don't. Um, I have done a lot of figure drawing in, in figure studio groups and I'm very familiar with the human body. I actually own one <laughs> and I went to nursing school so I've worked on cadavers. I, I understand what's inside and what's outside the human body. So I don't need a figure in front of me. It's part of what I have already one of my tools. You have a signature mark 
uh, to me, and Josie Glassberg in her essay refers to it as a tick mark or a hash mark. Um, these marks have a great deal of action and motion in them that keeps your paintings moving. So talk about, talk about what, how the, you keep these compositions alive. Um, well, like I said earlier, because I'm racing the sun, um, I have to move very quickly. And um, in the background of having to move very quickly is the, the knowledge that my little tiny sticks of pastel are really, really expensive. And being a cheapskate, I have to conserve my materials. Because, you know, I also live a far distance from being able to get them. So on a piece that's like this size, this is three and a half, four hours of work. And so when I lay out my original piece, you know, I, I start with a real quick charcoal sketch. And I keep in mind where my shadows are because they're really the most important. They're sort of the, the glue that holds it all together. And um, so I'll just put a pop of color where I want my shadows, and then I'll work in my mid-ranges. But because the light's changing all the time, I have to do this very quickly. So I'm constantly just putting a pop of colors here and there all over the paper. And by the time the sun has made sure that everything is gone that I originally saw, the paper is filled with all these really fast marks. <laughs> Well, they're great. They're, oh. they're, they're moving. Well, they're moving. Thank you. Um, can you talk about sandpaper that you're doing your work on and the, and the, under, the underdrawing? OK. Um, when I first started working with pastels, you know, I don't know anything about this stuff. I didn't go to school. I don't know it. Um, so I had these pastels, and I had some paper, and, and uh, making the pastel move over the surface of paper was kind of scritchy, and I didn't like it. So I started reading, and this was, you know, 45 years ago, 50 years ago. Who knows anything? And there was no internet. There was no Google. You couldn't, you had to go to the library and research stuff. And there was no information on pastels. There was no information on paper and I lived in a community where there were no other artists so I was totally on my own and so I started putting grit on paper I'd go down to the hardware store and I'd buy um, stuff that you put in cement and I'd glue it on my paper and I liked how that worked, but it was real rough and it ate up my pastels really fast and uh, oh a couple of years after I work that way. Um, a wonderful artist whose name is Wallace, I can't remember her first name, she came out with her own brand of pastel paper, which is wonderful. You can no longer get this stuff because it's also the same stuff that they use for skateboard skins, and there's a bigger market for skateboards than there is for artists. So she's gone over to the dark side, you know. But her paper, um, holds pastel so that you can work in layers without smudging it and getting mud. And because I like the look of a mark, but I also want to work deep, I just consistently use a sanded paper. And, and this stuff that I've got here, um, it's almost all 400 grit. Um, but oh, before she came out with her paper, I discovered a German company that sold uh, <laughs> automotive sandpaper. So I used automotive sandpaper for a number of years. And I started putting an undercoating with, pass, uh, with acrylic on the, the automotive paper because, you know, paper eats itself up. It, and I thought, well, if I put acrylic on it, that's plastic. You know, it'll protect my pastels from 
the acids in the paper underneath. So that's when I started using color, and I really, I don't like to work on white, and the, like, the red that I use, I don't like red. It agitates me, and so I get a better mark. And so <laughs> that's why a lot of my work has a red under, undercoat. Some of the work has um, lavender, and that has m more to do with the temperature that I'm trying to convey, you know, in the landscapes, the winter scenes, where it's cold or shadowy, you know, I'll have a lavender or uh, a colder, uh, colder color. Some of the figural pieces are on black, and um, I can't use that, that support color outside because it's mica, and mica sparkles, and I love the sparkle of mica, but it kind of stones me, so I can't go outside and play with it outside because who knows what I'll come up with. Um, so I use that primarily indoors. In your landscapes, there's a compositional component that appears frequently, um, your chimney. So tell us about the chimney. It must have been there for a while, so tell us all about the chimney. Well, Tuscarora, which is a place that I paint most frequently because that's where I live, um, is an old mining town established at some point in the 1860s. And the chimney, which is in right there on this piece, um, is the smokestack from the Union Mill, from the Union Mine. And it is 80 to 100 feet tall, and the bricks are falling out, and it's not going to be around forever. You know, it, it, the weather is really taking a toll on it. But it's something you can see for miles, and it's part of my landscape, so it does appear a lot. So I believe it's in the above the one. Oh yes, it's in this one here too. And these green things that often appear in my work are um, are water tanks for the town. Sydney, what are you working on now? Well, I have been, the past month, I've been making books. And um, I'm going on a trip starting next week, and I want to give gifts to the people that we'll be seeing. And so I'm making them sketchbooks. So that takes a, a you know a fair amount of time. I haven't been able to get out and paint outside, which is actually kind of making me a crazy lady, um, because the weather has been a little bit gnarly, and I just haven't been able to. So you know, I occupy myself with other things, and I also um, am working on some children's books. Sydney, thank you for your generous answering my questions and giving us a tour of the show. Um, one other component, Josie Glassberg wrote the essay for Sydney's exhibition, and it is posted online on our website, ccainv.org, and there are handouts here in the, in the gallery that you can pick up when you come to see the show. Um, I want to thank uh, in addition to thanking Sydney, I want to thank the college 
um, for the use of their bristlecone gallery and we're delighted to have this work here for the city the community um, and you can follow CCAI on our website on Facebook and Instagram and come see the work in all four of our galleries here in Carson City there's plenty of parking um, you'll find more artist interviews on our YouTube channel and we want to thank our generous funders that keep CCI moving forward. Thank you for watching.